You know, I've been brutally honest with you. I hate to say brutally. In the world we live in, it's, um, it's absolutely become a cupcake society where so many people walk on eggshells. And the problem is you don't, you're, how can I say this nicely? You're lying constantly because you're afraid to tell the truth. Like when some, no, not you. You're perfect. <laughs> but there's a way to do it. When somebody says something to you or they say a joke to you that's not appropriate or whatever, you just have to let them know what is right and true. Because when you're going along with them, you just live in a lie. And then you walk away and you feel bad, right? Because you're afraid to offend them. Maybe you'll straighten them out. Maybe you'll help them. Isn't that what the Holy Spirit's supposed to do? For you and I, isn't that what it's doing? Didn't Yeshua walk in truth all the time? Because he wouldn't compromise what he knew to be true? Don't fall prey to that. Don't, don't look to win the applause of people. Go for the applause of heaven. Now, now, when I say that, let me give a caveat. Some people are just mean-spirited. They say things to, to be destructive. And they're peacetakers, not peacemakers. I'm not saying that by no means. But it's said when honesty has to be called brutality. You know, brutally honest. I'm going to tell you, you know, Bernadette's Bernadette and I'm me and this is who we are. And I thank God that we could, we could start a, a, a place where we didn't have to inherit a culture. Because when you go to another church and you become the pastor, you inherit that culture. You inherit those elders. And it's hard to break that culture. It's almost impossible. That's why you see a revolving door churches. Pastor, pastor. Because if, if he tries to change something, they will come against him because it's Laodicea, the people ruling. And you have to establish a culture. I can't begin to tell you how many shaky marriages there are in the ministry. And one of the reasons for that is because the church becomes the mistress of the pastor. It's very sad. And he, he, even though he doesn't mean to or want to, he will sacrifice his family on the altar of ministry. I, I won't do that. I'd rather lose all of you before I lose my family. I don't want to lose any of you, but God first and foremost. Before Burnham, before the kids, it's the Lord. But then they are right there. I cannot treat your... Listen... There's some sick thing in the South where the past is supposed to be available 24-7. God is available 24-7. And my job is to get you to be connected with him so closely that I'm not the issue. You follow? Men, you are the high priest of your family. Act like it. Wear it well. This is your flock, your children. That's your congregation. Even if you do... Some people go to church three times a week, right? The Wednesday night... Sunday morning, Sunday night thing, that's traditional in the South. Okay, what about, that's what, three hours? There's 168 hours in the week. An additional 165 hours that the Lord is asking you to lead your family. You have a church. Your house is your sanctuary. Your table is where you fellowship. Your kids are your flock. You are the high priest. It, it is not my idea. It's his idea. I don't do this to alleviate or shuck responsibility. I do this because I don't want to rewrite the book. God has a system, and it's worked for hundreds of years well, and we don't need to change that system. We don't need to add to it or take away with it. Look, Father knows best. Period. Um, Purim is this Wednesday and Thursday. Just to clear the air, do, do, do... How do I say, Lord, it's so crazy, right? Do Gentiles have to celebrate Purim? No. It's not one of the Levitical holidays. I know that's disrupting some of you. I know I'm grafted in, yes. But if you're a Christian, if you're born again, that's a big if, but if you're born again, is it part of your history? Yes. This is your history. If I don't care what denomination you're from, it is Judeo-Christianity. You can have Judaism without Christianity. You cannot have Christianity without Judaism, period. And this is part of your history. And if there was no Purim, you'd be cutting yourself right now and throwing your kids to the fire. 
And it's a sad state of affairs. A sad state of affairs. I spoke to somebody 46 years in ministry. I said, did you ever preach on the book of Esther? No. No. Why? It's Jewish. Your whole faith is Jewish, knucklehead. The whole Bible is written by Jews. Oh, no, Rabbi, I read somewhere that Luke was not Jewish. Where, where do you read that? Well, we've been taught that, yeah? Okay, if you've been taught that, then Romans 3 is a lie, that all the oracles were trusted to the Jews. If Luke's a non-Jew, then that's a lie. Throw the Bible out. Let's get out of here. Just another tradition. Do your research. You'll find out. The whole book was written by Jews, to Jews, in a Jewish place about a Jewish Messiah. How can you negate that? Does it mean you have to be Jewish? You can't be if you're not born Jewish. <laughs> you can't be. That's not possible, but buddy, Romans says you are grafted in. Okay, they weren't grafted out. I know that, I know this might sound very sarcastic, but when Jesus comes back and teaches, you're going to see. You're going to see. He ain't coming back Methodist or Presbyterian. He is the king of Israel, and he's coming back the king of Israel. He was Jewish, is Jewish, and if you're not looking for a Jewish king, you're going to miss him. So we celebrate Purim because it is an amazing story. It could be one of my favorite things to preach from. It's a no-brainer. Any of you can preach about Purim. Well, almost any of you. But it's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable story. It just defies any natural law. It's historical. It's in the Persian history books. You would have to have more faith, much more faith, to believe in, in these co supposed coincidences than a God who's converging circumstances. You follow? You'd have to have more faith because it's a ridiculous story. And it's, it's an amazing story. It's filled with mystery and murder and mayhem Forget about these idiot shows you watch. I'm telling you, Purim is, it's unbelievable. So if, am I excited? Heck yeah. Yeah. If it wasn't Purim, would I be excited? Yeah. It's Shabbat. If it wasn't Shabbat, would I be excited? Yeah, because God is great. You follow? There's no time I'm not excited because God is God, right? Amen? Amen? Okay, Psalm 124, if Adonai hadn't been for us, that's a big if, right? That, that if is the difference between deliverance and disaster. The greatest proof that there's a God is the nation of Israel. More than anything else, they survived two exiles. War after one, every deliverance was miraculous. But the crazy thing is, every single deliverance was prophesied hundreds of years before the event. There's no rhyme or reason for them to be in existence. Every Gentile nation has oppressed them. And this little country, less than the size of New Jersey, stands. Not because of their cleverness, not because of their military prowess, not because they're Jewish, because they got a God who's always looking out for them. And if you're grafted in, if you're grafted in, if you're a Gentile grafted in through the blood of Yeshua, then you have a God. They don't have a monopoly on him. You have a God that's always looking out for you. Do you understand it? Their very existence solidifies your security in God. Do you understand this? This is why it's so important to get with the program. Judeo-Christianity. Okay? You call me a Messianic Jew, Fine, I'm a Jew who believes in Messiah. But I would never call you a Baptist or a Methodist. We are believers, and we are brethren, and we are brothers and sisters in the Lord with the same blood flowing through our veins. Okay? What's my blood type? Why? Yours might be J, but it's the same blood type. <laughs> if I don't know it hadn't been for us, let Israel repeat it. If I don't know it hadn't been for us, when people rose to attack us, the sieges, the massacres, the crusades, the pogroms, the ovens, the bombs, the gas chambers, they won't leave us alone. They won't leave us alone. 
When their anger blazed against us, they would have swallowed us up alive. Then the water would have engulfed us, the torrent would have swept over us. Yes, the raging water would have swept right over us. Blessed be Adonai who did not leave us to the prey of their teeth. When you read teeth in the Bible, it's Gentile oppression. What does that mean? Gentile and Christian are different. Gentile means of the nations. The nations have oppressed us everywhere. Everywhere. We escaped like a bird from the hunter's trap. The trap is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of Adonai. The maker of heaven and earth. I love Israel. It's my heritage. I love the Jewish people which I'm part of. But I got news for you. I'm going to preach at a friend's church. This guy is about as Gentile as they come. He was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention in Tennessee. He was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention in Georgia. Those are two of the biggest Southern Baptists. He has been with Christians United for Israel. He is very well known. You know the, the Family Research Council? That is about the strongest Christian lobby in the nation. When they have a group going to Israel, he's their Bible instructor. Okay? And he totally gets this. He said when he went to Israel in 1995, he said his Bible was born again. He's from Tennessee. You know, he calls himself a hillbilly. He's no hillbilly. He's pretty sharp and pretty bright. But last week I watched his service live. I thought I was, a, I was watching a Messianic rabbi. He explained so much Jewish culture. It was unbelievable. And the sick thing is, I'm going there today, and tomorrow in four services, I'm going to preach about the cross and sound like a Baptist minister. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you say something? Look, guys, as a believer, you know, we would have been completely subdued by the world and the flesh and the enemy. You think God's not for you because you're going through some troubles. We all go through some troubles. In this world, you'll have tribulation. I don't know who told you differently, but Jesus told us very plainly. You would. But your troubles are confined to this life. Your sins, even. Your suffering, your sorrow, your sadness, your sickness. Confined to this life. For the non-believer, it's horrific. It's just a foretaste of what they're going to experience forever. This has an ending for us. I tell you all the times, our end days are not our end days. They're the end of our bad days and the beginning of our good days. We have a crazy, ridiculous, blessed hope. And that was all done by a God who's crazy about us. And not just us, but the whole world. Just some people will not see it. I don't quite understand, but I'm never going to stop telling them. Father, thank you so much for this day. It's Shabbat. Thank you so much for your upcoming feast where you've displayed your goodness and your greatness and your love. Even when people were faithless, you remain faithful. Amazing God, amazing grace. Be blessed today as we recount your goodness and your greatness. We love you and we bless you. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Shabbat shalom, guys.